I could draw your attention to verse 12. Last week I preached on the first miracle of Jesus in Cana where he turned water into wine. In today's sermon I've titled it, The Son's Cleansing of the Father's House. Again, today's sermon is titled, The Son's Cleansing of the Father's House. I'm going to preach from verse 12 all the way till verse 17, and then next week we'll conclude, Lord willing, with John chapter 2. God's Word says, starting at verse 12, After this he went down to Capernaum, he and his mother, and his brethren, and his disciples, and they continued there not many days. And the Jews' Passover was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem and found in the temple those that sold oxen and sheep and doves and the changers of money sitting. And when he had made a scourge of small cords, he drove them all out of the temple and the sheep and the oxen and poured out the changers' money and overthrew the tables and said unto them that sold doves take these things hence make not my father's house an house of merchandise and his disciples remembered that it was written the zeal of thine house has eaten me up lord god almighty please be with us today lord lord we know your Holy Spirit gives sight to those who are blind. The Holy Spirit gives ears to those who cannot hear. So we pray, Lord, for those who are watching via the Internet and those that are here today. I pray, Lord, that you will make these passages more clearly to us. We pray, Lord, that you will exposit them for us that you will reveal to us heavenly truths that only your people could truly understand because Christ is the Lord, our righteousness. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Verse 12, the author states, after this, if you notice in my sermons, I always try to break down sermons into sections. Because you want to make sure that you focus on the context and you want to place people almost as if they were actually there. So here in this message, the author says, after this, showing us that what takes place now was directly after that moment when Jesus Christ performed his first miracle. By first miracle, I'm referring to his turning water into wine. Jesus Christ did something that only God could do. Could take water, have there be objective observers who were there as witnesses, and Jesus Christ would do something that could only be done by the true God. No one today could turn water into wine. And no one could today could do what Jesus Christ has already accomplished. If you remember from last week, I explained the purpose of these miracles because the text tells us here, after this, so I'm placing you back just for a moment to tell you the purpose of these miracles. Jesus performed many miracles and scriptures to display his absolute sovereignty over everything. He determines when things take place. He determines why they take place. He determines who will be a witness to these miracles and who will not be. Jesus Christ performed these miracles because he accomplishes all that he said he would do. Jesus Christ performs these miracles to display that he is truly who he said he was. He is God and he is also fully man but without sin. He is holy God and holy man in one person. 
Jesus Christ also performed these miracles as a means to communicate heavenly truth to his disciples who subsequently believed in him. Jesus Christ performed these miracles ultimately for his glory. That is why Jesus Christ performed these miracles. And the text tells us after this, then he went down to Capernaum. So we see his path. Here he was in Cana. Now he went to Capernaum. This is why many people will argue that he was an itinerant preacher. He didn't just stay in one place. He traveled many miles to proclaim his person and work. Now when you read about this place Capernaum, rather than getting into some long drawn out discussion as to the historical sketch of Capernaum, I always like to associate places with biblical events that took place in scripture. So if you read about Capernaum, what's Capernaum most notable for? There are some good and some bad every time you see Capernaum mentioned in the Bible. But as I read through scriptures in my Bible reading, I see Jesus Christ regarding the bad. Remember how this is one of the places that he upbraided. Jesus Christ gave a strong rebuke to Capernaum. If you remember the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus had said, Capernaum, he says, you have been exalted to heaven, but you will be brought down to hell. For if the mighty works were done in you that had been done in Sodom, they would have been around today. But he said it would be more tolerable for the land of Sodom than it would be for them on the day of judgment. This is the bad when we read about Capernaum because he rebuked them. But we also see some notable events that took place throughout biblical history that we can associate with Capernaum as well. A great example would be the centurion. The Bible mentions Capernaum and then it talks about the centurion. Now, If you remember the story of the centurion, God's word reveals to us that he had a servant that was ill or sick with palsy. And he went to Jesus and said something that not many people were saying during this time. He told him, my servant is sick with palsy. And Jesus Christ heard his plea or his petition. And Jesus says, I will go to him and heal him. Now, what the centurion said was noteworthy because he said, I'm not worthy for you to even come into my home. I'm not even worthy for you to even step foot in my home. You just say the word and he'll be healed. For I'm a man under authority. And if I tell someone to go and to come or to do this and do that, they'll do it. But he was basically indicating that he believed Christ was much greater from above while he is below. And Jesus told him that he had not seen such faith like this. Think about it. During Jesus' time, the Pharisees were accusing Jesus of being a blasphemer and having a devil. And yet this person, a centurion of all people, when he saw Jesus, he knew who he was and he said, you don't even need to travel all this way. You just say these words and it'll take place. This right here is evidence that this man believed that Jesus Christ was fully God. And he was sent into this world to accomplish a redemption for his people. And he knew this. These are some examples when you talk about Capernaum that you have to have in the back of your mind. And this is the place that Jesus went to. The texture says after this, so after the miracles that took place, he went to this place called Capernaum. But look who he took with him. He had an audience with him. A very distinct audience. And let's read about the audience that was with him. He took with him his mother, his brethren, his disciples. And they only went there for a short time. Isn't it interesting, John here, clearly was no papist. And the reason why, look how he addresses Mary from Scripture. Does he address her as Queen Mary? Does he address her as Blessed Mary? Does he address her as Holy Mary? 
Does he address her as queen of heaven? No. You won't find any idolatrous statements by John to Mary. He refers to her multiple times as the, right here, read what it says. In verse 12, he refers to her as his mother. He also refers to her as woman. You don't find references to blessed. You don't find very reference, many references to queen. You don't find that language here by John. Remember what I talked to you guys last week. I'm not going to reiterate it again because I talked about it last week. Remember the doctrine of Mariology that papists love to affirm. You must remember them. And you must remember them for apologetic purposes, not to be edified because these are truths. No. You want to remember these points of Mariology so you know how to refute the Roman Catholic heresies today. Remember, they believe Jesus is mother, Mary is mother of God, so they can elevate her to being queen of heaven. They say that she is without stain of original sin, yet the Bible tells us that clearly she was a sinner, that she said, I rejoice in God my Savior. Catholics believe that Mary was uh, carried up into heaven. They call it the Assumption of Mary, but the Bible says no such thing. And Catholics also argue that Mary remained a perpetual virgin. But we know Scripture says after the birth of Christ, with respect to his humanity, her and Joseph had children. And as evidence of this, look at the text. In verse 12, it says, He, his mother, and his brethren. Now, brethren could be looked at in several ways. Brethren has several different examples in Scripture of how this, how this is used. For example, brethren could refer to Christian brethren. You only call someone a brother in Christ if they affirm the same gospel that was proclaimed by Christ. If they don't affirm the same gospel that was proclaimed by Christ, then rest assured they are no brother of mine. They are no brother of Christ. They are no brother of Paul's. They are no brother of any Bible-believing Christian. Brethren could also refer to brethren in the flesh, fellow citizens of the same country. Paul used this language in Romans when he talked about his kinsmen according to the flesh, people that were from the same country as him. It could be used even contextually today. If you ever served in the military, you can say my brother at arms, or you could say my fellow American brothers. They're from the same country. You serve in the same military, or you could also refer to it as the brethren of your own home, your siblings. You could say, I have a brother, my blood brother. Well, we know Jesus had brothers because Mary and Joseph, after the birth of Christ, with respect to his humanity, remember, Jesus Christ is eternal. He has always been God, but he assumed a human nature. So when the Bible speaks of the virgin birth conceived by the Holy Spirit, that is with respect to the incarnation. But after this, her and Joseph had children, and they are called James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas. So you have to remember these examples of how brethren is used to understand the audience that Jesus had with him. He, his mother, and his brethren, and also his disciples. Who were the disciples that were with him? If you're paying careful attention to detail to John chapter 1, just go back. Anytime you read scripture and it tells us his disciples, always go back to the immediate context of chapter 1 when it says he had called John the Apostle. John the Apostle in scripture is regarded as the disciple whom Jesus loved. He is the one that was at the foot of Jesus when he was being crucified on that cross. And it was John the Apostle was the one that he had called to be his disciple and his apostle that he commissioned to carry out his purpose. 
Additionally, we know that he also called Andrew and also Simon, which we know today as Peter. He also called Philip and Nathaniel. And I mentioned before, Nathaniel in the Bible, I believe, would likely refer to Bartholomew. Now, some people will say, well, how do you gather that? And some people will make a case. Well, count the disciples. How many disciples do you have in the Bible? You have Philip, Andrew, Simon the Canaanite, Simon also called Paul, uh, Peter, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thaddeus, Thomas, James, son of Alphaeus, James, son of Zebedee, Simon, and Judas. So if you take a look at Bartholomew and you say, well, if it's not Bartholomew, then it's Nathaniel. So you're saying it's Nathaniel and Bartholomew. So what are you saying? We have 13 disciples at this time? No. So that's why I argue Bartholomew and Nathaniel are likely referring to the same person. And I explained last time why I came to this conclusion. So now we have a picture here of the trajectory of Jesus. After he performed this miracle, now he's headed to this place called Capernaum. He has these people that are with him, but they only stayed here for a very short time. Now this is not uncommon in Jesus' time. If you remember from reading the Gospel of John, and even in the Synoptic Gospels, didn't the Bible make it explicitly clear that Jesus was an itinerant preacher, so he would travel from one place to another, some would be short, some would be very long distances. We read about this in Scripture, and Jesus even said things like, foxes have dens, bird of the air has nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. So we knew he had these short places that he met at, so he would, at times, he would be considered homeless. Or the Bible says when Jesus invites the disciples to have fellowship with them, he would say, this is my abode. In other words, a place where he would set up rest for a great period of time. Let's move on to verse 13. And the Jews' Passover was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. As we talk about the Passover, John puts us at a very specific point in history, at the Passover. Now, if you read about the Passover in the Bible, what the Bible here is referring to is what took place going back into the Old Testament. If you understand the Passover, the significance of this and what this commemorates or what this signifies, if you don't know, you must pay attention because it is pointing us to the gospel. When you deal with the Passover, remember what God's command was for his servants back in the Exodus account, particularly chapter 12. God had to give a command to Moses and to others, and he said, Take for yourself a lamb without blemish. What do you think the lamb had to be without blemish? Well, if you read the New Testament, it articulates why. Knowing that you were redeemed, not with corruptible things like gold or silver, the vain conversations of the traditions of your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. Without blemish or spot. Put another way, it means he was sinless. So they had to pick out a lamb that signified without sin. That's why it had to be without blemish. This is even why the author of Hebrews said that he is holy, harmless, undefiled, separated from sinners, higher than the heavens. Without blemish. Without spot. Sinless. Remember this. When you hear someone say that Jesus was contaminated or Jesus was tainted, the Bible is clear he was not. He was without sin, without blemish, without spot, without sin. The only time the Bible tells us that Jesus Christ was made sin was only by imputation. Remove the topic of imputation. Now what you have is a different Jesus. So it's only by imputation imputation so when they commanded them to take this lamb without blemish during the Passover again I'm still back on the topic of John chapter 2 verse 13 addressing the Passover 
the Passover, they had to select a lamb without spot, and they had to choose it out from among the goats. So this had to be a very special lamb, designed as a substitute and as a sacrifice. And they were required to take this lamb and slaughter this lamb and take the blood and put it over the doorposts and put it on the house because God had said, I am going to come upon Egypt and I am going to trample them with an inexpressible fierceness. I am going to kill their children by death is what he was going to do. And unless that blood covered the house Rest assured, though, you will wake up and you will hear weeping and wailing, but there will be no moderation of mercy because I will not relent my fierce judgment upon them. They will die in their sleep. And that is essentially what he said. So the Passover lamb or the blood that covered the house, God says, I will pass over them. I will pass over them. And so notice the typology here. The typology, what does it signify? It signifies only God's elect were covered with the blood of Christ. Only God's elect will be redeemed from the curse of the law, from the power of death and the thraldom of Satan. Only those that are covered by the blood, only those that are covered and washed away and their robes are made white as snow, are those that will be passed over. So that's why it talks about here, this Passover that was at hand, it was a, a celebratory event. Many of these Jews claimed to know it very well, but they ignored the typology. They ignored what it signified. Many of them did. But what's unique here about this Passover is that in John's Gospel, John is one of the very few people in the Bible that highlight all of these Passovers in the duration between Christ's birth all the way up until the point when he was stapled to a tree and the weight of his body rested upon that peg. John highlights these Passovers. So we see here in John 2, this I believe is the first Passover but if you also pay careful attention to detail in John, you'll see it in John 5. You'll see it also in John 6. You'll also see it in the Gospel of John. I think it's 18. I hope I'm right. I was studying and I remember that it was, I believe, 18. So it's 5, 6, and 18. But I believe there were four Passovers that John records from John's Birth, I'm sorry, to the time of Jesus' birth with respect to his humanity or his assumption of his human nature all the way up until the time that he was crucified. There were four. And ultimately, remember this, the commemoration or what this signified, this Passover, this celebration that was at hand during this time after the first miracle Remember this about this that took place. It points us to Christ. It ultimately points us to Christ. Galatians 4 says, In the fullness of time, God sent forth the Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who are under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because you are sons, God sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your heart, crying, Abba, Father. So this puts a puts a important focus on the context of where this took place and at what time period during the first Passover. This historical event of Jesus Christ displaying a righteous anger towards the wicked, which we're about to see here in a moment. The text says, and the the Jews' Passover was at hand, and Jesus now went up to Jerusalem. He went up to Jerusalem because this is where he knew many would be. Because remember, many of these people were had a lot of zeal, but they had no knowledge. 
A lot of these people prided themselves on being Jews, and they made their boast in the law, but they were guilty of the same hypocrisy that they accused the Gentiles of. These people boasted that they were Jews by name only, yet Jesus came to testify about his gospel and to summons those that were true Jews, the elect. Because that's what true Jews are, the elect, the invisible church. It has always been his invisible church. Very important. And this is why Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Remember, Jesus came to save those that knew there were sinners, not coming to call those that they were righteous. And the people he called who knew there were sinners, these were people that were granted that gospel repentance. They knew that they had a change of mind, that the true gospel opposes all false gospels. They could not tolerate anything that desecrated or trampled on the glorious gospel of Christ's saving work on behalf of his particular people. And Jesus came into the world to save his elect sheep. And as he head to Jerusalem, let's now read what the Bible says, what he discovered. Verse 14, And found in the temple those that sold oxen and sheep and doves, and the changers of money sitting. Verse 14, it says, And found in the temple those that sold oxen and sheep. Please understand, the Bible does not tell us here that there were actually a worship and inside the place of worship were these individuals involved in this type of monstrosity. No. I believe this is what's called the court of the Gentiles. I was reading one scholar by the name of Robertson and he made a good point. This is within the precinct of the temple. As we move on into 14, 15, 16, and 17, which I believe highlights the crux of my sermon today, dealing with the son's cleansing of the father's temple, you have to pay careful attention to detail to certain things that you're going to read. We read here that Jesus Christ overthrew here the tables, a righteous display of anger. Now, if you read Matthew Mark and Luke, you're going to see some similarities. So if you read Matthew, Mark, and Luke, you're going to see Jesus Christ overthrowing certain money changers' tables. But I want to warn you here, some pastors today will say, well, if we preach on John, then we've covered what took place in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Or some people are going to argue what took place in Matthew, Mark, and Luke and what takes place here in John 2 are all referring to the same event. Now, if people say this, or if that's what you believe, let me ask you an honest question. Have you actually studied these verses? It's an honest question. Have you actually studied? Because I want to challenge you today if you think it's all referring to the same event. I'm here to tell you I do not believe it was. I believe what took place in Matthew, Mark, and Luke and what takes place here in the Gospel of John chapter 2 are different events. So what I'm saying is basically Jesus Christ overturned many tables. This was not a one-time isolated event. If you think Jesus Christ only turned over one table, I'm here to tell you respectfully that you're wrong. And I'm going to share several reasons why. If you read the Gospel of John chapter 2, the first things you, you should notice are a couple things. That it talks about those that sold, but it doesn't say those that bought. Do you notice that here in the Gospel of John? If you read the Gospel of John, notice how when you, when you read, when he overthrew the tables, who were at the tables? You should pay careful attention to detail to that and contrast John 2 also with Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And if you read how G uh, Jesus' interaction with those who sold doves here in John 2, contrast that with what took place in 
the others. You have to contrast these. And if you contrast these, you'll see that what I'm telling you is true. They are not referring to the same events. There was one author that made some very strong, compelling arguments. I don't agree with everything this author sta states. Nonetheless, I have to give proper attribution. An old scholar back in the day by the name of Matthew Poole made some good points that I'll share with you right now because I agree with these points as it pertains to John chapter 2, 14 through 17 on why John 2 is a different time than what you read in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Let me share with you several reasons why. If you were to take a look at John 2 right here in my right hand, and if you were to take a look at Matthew, Mark, and Luke in my left, if you read John 2, you'll notice that him overthrowing the money changers' tables takes place about several years before, and it's taking place at the first Passover, where the others take place at the fourth. Important. Compare and contrast. Second, the other things that you want to notice, remember what I said a moment ago. If you read John two, uh, chapter 2, notice how he talks about those that sold. Read John 2, 14 through 17. It only talks about those that sold. If you read the others, it talks about those that sold and bought. Okay, so you have additional setting here, okay? If you look at John chapter 2, what does he say to them that's different from the others? In John chapter 2, he says something to the extent of, uh, you made my father, don't make my father's place a house of merchandise. Well, in the others, it's a little bit different. He says it should be a house of prayer, and he also says they have made it a den of thieves. And lastly, what was Jesus' interaction with those that sold doves? Take a look at verse 16. And he said unto them that sold doves, Take these things hence. Make not my father's house a house of merchandise. So those that sold doves, he tells them, Take your things away from here. Well, that's not how we dealt with the people that sold doves in the others. You know what he did to the others? He overthrew their tables. So you have to contrast. It's a different audience. The point I'm trying to get across is quite simple. Jesus overthrew many tables. It wasn't a one-time isolated incident. Some pastors who I believe preach watery down, cotton candy, feel good, gospelist messages, they like to act like Jesus only had a a one-time isolated incident. I'm sure he regretted it. That's what false teachers will say. But that's clearly not the case. So, I would take you back to the context here in verse 14. And let me address a little bit more. It says, And found in the temple those that sold oxen and sheep and doves, and the changers of money sitting. Now, if you know what changers of money sitting means... How many of you, by show of hands, ever been to a different country? Anybody? Okay, I know some of you guys have been to different countries. But if you ever go to a different country, you know some of them will not accept the American dollar. I took my family to Mexico not long ago. And one of the things that we did was we stopped off at this little, what looks almost like the old school when you go see a movies, right? It's a glass door and... You get up there and you're not picking up tickets, but you're taking your money and they're converting it over to their dollar. Well, essentially, that's what they were doing here. People that traveled from long distance, they were taking their money and they were converting it to the coin of their day because they wanted to take advantage of collecting as much as they could for personal gain. This goes to show how they were treating the house of God. How they were treating, or of course they were in the precinct of the temple, and they were in the court of the Gentiles, it doesn't matter. We saw that they were trying to use a religious gathering for personal gain, for self-aggrandizement, for self-promotion. All to make a profit to the detriment of what they claimed to believe. 
So it goes to show you the type of people here that Jesus Christ was about to encounter. So now that you see where Jesus came from, where he was going, the type of people that he was dealing with, now let's take a look at how he responded to them. Jesus didn't respond to them with niceties. He wasn't responding to them by saying, could you please just take your stuff out of here? Jesus responded to them the way the Son of God responded to them. Read verse 15. And when he had made a scourge of, sm of small cords, he drove them all out of the temple and the sheep and the oxen and poured out the changer's money and overthrew the tables. Jesus Christ basically made whips. Makes you wonder if he actually took those whips and actually whipped it at a few people to scare them off, or if he actually made contact. The Bible doesn't say. We can postulate all day long. We can opine what we think. It doesn't matter what we think. The Bible doesn't explicitly state. But what we do know is Jesus Christ here displayed a righteous anger as he went. And this shows us his disposition towards people and how they desecrate the things of God. Or how they use religion for the sake of personal gain. Now when the Bible tells us here that he made these whips, you have to pay careful attention to detail what they signify. When the Bible describes here a whips or the scourge of cords, essentially what this indicates is his righteous anger. What this reveals to us is his indignation towards those that try to desecrate the things of God for the sake of personal gain. But it also reveals to us his disposition towards those that are guilty of will worship. In other words, worship in a manner that God has not prescribed in his word. They're worshiping God in a manner which they believe is conducive towards trying to get a large crowd. And that's very popular what we see even today. And Jesus condemns it. But it's also a reminder of God's judgment that has come upon those that do not believe in the gospel. Ladies and gentlemen, please understand this. Religion today is not a game. People view religion today as, oh, he's just zealous. He'll eventually become more tempered. He'll eventually become a little bit more laid back and mature just like me. They don't realize. Do you guys know that there is a great in dark ominous cloud that is coming on the horizon and it's called judgment god's wrath is coming and his eschatological judgment it cannot be put out the fires of hell cannot be eradicated and when it comes there is nothing you can do to prevent it the loved ones you have in this life that do not obey the gospel that do not affirm the gospel but they're stuck in dead religion dead works self-righteousness entertainment you cannot harbor them you cannot provide them a place of rest because the judgment of god is coming because scripture tells us in second thessalonians in flaming fire taking vengeance on them that know not god and do not obey the gospel of our lord jesus christ so what we read here when jesus goes in there with these whips and he starts overthrowing their tables this is a sign of what is to come. This is what we see all throughout Scripture. What do you think it means here when it says in verse 15, it says he drove them out of the temple to drive out. It's basically saying that there were many people that came that will be turned back. Very symbolic of what we read even in Matthew 7. When many come to Jesus and they believe they were saved, we did this, we did that, we cast out demons, cleanse leper, heal many men in your name. Oh, we're a Christian, right? No, you're not. 
Because you're presenting before the Lord your works, your doctrine of works, your false gospel. And Jesus said to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you worker of iniquity. So when he says here, he drove them out. It's similar of what we read about in Matthew 7. He will drive out. If you want to know what this looks like today, imagine for a moment, and I'll ask the men here, specifically all of us here have families we have people that are dependent upon us as the man of the house you have a responsibility to protect your home that is your responsibility as a man is to protect your home you're not going to allow someone come in and plunder your goods and take away that which belongs to you think about that for a moment okay so if you knew there was a suspicious person outside and you felt he was dangerous and he came to your house and said Judge not. After all, the Jesus ate with tax collectors and sinners. Welcome in me in your house and you can go right back to work. Are you going to allow that person in your house? Likely not. I would hope you would say no. If you loved your family, you would say no. Get out of here. And you're going to have to demand that that person leaves. But why would you demand that he leaves? Because you don't know him. You don't know what he's going to do in your house. And you're going to tell him and you're going to demand he leave or you're likely going to call the cops. Now that's from a human perspective. That's from a perspective of how we would talk as Christians. But Christ is God, but he's also fully man, but without sin. When he responds to someone, depart from me, it means my father never gave you to me. I never died in your stead. My blood never washed away your sin. I have no intimate relationship with you. So when he says, I never knew you, that doesn't mean he has no clue who they are. That means he has no relationship with them. They are not of God. They are of the devil. Depart from me. You're not welcome here. That's his attitude towards the wicked. And this is what he's telling us here in this text towards those that do not believe in the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then it says he also in verse 15, he says here, he poured out and overthrew. Now, if you look at this and you apply it to what you see, how people today worship and what they believe in, rest assured that's the same attitude he's going to have when people stand before his tribunal. When people stand before the judgment seat of Christ and they present before him the very same false fire that these false Jews or false Christians presented before him, he's going to pour it out. In other words, because it is a stench of death before his sight. It is a false fire. It is obstinacy. And therefore, he will toss it out as filthy rags as they are. This is what the Bible is revealing to us. Now we have to take a look at how this applies to us today. You must take a look at the application in several different aspects. First of all, if you take a look at the application of John chapter 2, dealing with Jesus' righteous anger of taking whips and going into this place and actually overthrowing and pouring out their belongings, showing them how he truly feels about their worship that they're presenting. Now, if you take a look at this, the application that you want to take away from this is some people today believe that you can never give a rebuke, that you can never speak with any kind of righteous anger, that you can never show a disposition of hatred towards false doctrine. And people think this, but yet they're missing John chapter 2 right in front of us. And they believe that if you ever so much as say anything that would be regarded as unloving, mean-spirited, unchristlike, they're going to start saying things like, he who is without sin cast the first stone and judge not. All the things that lost people love to cite. Now let me ask you a question. Was it unchristlike? Was it mean-spirited? Was it unloving for Jesus Christ to overthrow the money changers' tables? Well, first of all, you can't say it's unchristlike because he is Christ. 
You can't say it's unloving because love reflects his divine nature. The point I'm trying to get across, it's the most sometimes, the most loving thing you can do is to do the exact same thing when you see all these false gospels and false worship that take place among you. That's the point I'm trying to get across. People today tend to become what's called tone police. So if you say to a false teacher, I reject your false gospel, don't you come around this place because if you come around again and you set your false gospel material here in our congregation, because people will do that. People will visit churches. They'll bring literature. Hey, can we set them down here? No, you can't set them down here. You take that stuff and you throw it in the trash if they do. You'll be surprised how people will do that. They'll slip material in. And some people will say, well, that's just the most unloving thing. They'll even accuse you of being arrogant. That's, the, that's like a most common thing I hear today is that's arrogant. How is it arrogant if you are protecting the flock of God if you are keeping that which is holy, pure, and not allowing it to be desecrated the same way these lost people were doing here. But again, it's all about tone. People try to get into it. Well, what about your tone? I don't like your tone. Well, again, let's get away from the subjective nonsense. Tone, it's about doctrine. It's about principle. It's about context. Please pay attention to detail about the context. Look at the context of Matthew 23. When Jesus ran into the, the Pharisees, the hypocrites, he didn't cease from not calling them out by name. He referred to them as blind guides, fools, hypocrites, serpents, generation of vipers. Was that unloving for him to do that? You can't say it's unloving because love reflects his divine nature. So if Jesus Christ did it, then it is an act of love. Additionally, take a look at doctrine as well. People think that Jesus and the Bible, they always go to certain selective verses. If you ask someone, so what do you like about Jesus' teaching? Well, Jesus says he's love. Jesus wept. Oh, the woman at the well. Or Jesus Christ looking at his mother saying, behold your son, behold your mother. And they love to romance Bible verses. But I'm like, okay, great. I love those verses just like you do. But what about the other verses when he says in John chapter 6, no one comes to me unless my father who sent me draws him. What about that text? Do you like that text just as much? What about John chapter 8 when he told the lost people? He said to them, you are not able to understand you're not able to hear my word. You're not able to believe. You are not of God. You are of your father, the devil. Do you believe in that text too? Do you agree with those passages? Are they your favorite Jesus' passages also? What about John chapter 10? When Jesus says, you don't believe because you're not my sheep. Are those your favorite Bible verses too? What about John 12 when he says that lost people cannot hear and they cannot see because God has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts? What about John 17 when he tells the lost people? That I don't pray for the world, but I pray only for my sheep. Are those your favorite Bible verses also? So the reason why I'm bringing this up, because today people act like Jesus Christ overthrowing the money changers tables doesn't exist. Oh, it exists, and it takes place more than once. And also, you can't use the example of, oh, I don't like your tone. I don't like how you're approaching this situation. I think you're arrogant. I think you're mean-spirited, unloving, unchristlike. He who is without sin cast the first stone. Those arguments don't work on Bible believers because Bible believers actually read their Bible. They believe what they say they read. Additionally, you also want to take a look at the application of this as it pertains to worship. You must take a look at this as it pertains to worship. Look at what takes place here in the context of John. They were going up to the Passover was at hand. This was a very significant time that takes place. You're dealing with God passing over his people because they had the blood over the doorposts. This is a huge, huge thing to celebrate. So you're dealing essentially with worship. And if you take a look at how Jesus' interaction with people that came to these places for the sake of profit or gain or monetary uh, purposes, 
Jesus' attitude towards them was filled with righteous anger. It absolutely was. How do you think Jesus' interaction is going to be when he comes back and he sees what takes place in so many of these so-called churches today? I guarantee you it's not going to be good. Because if you think about it, I would argue if you take a look at what a true church is in the Bible and compare that to the vast majority of churches today, you're going to find that they're so different. Okay? Because in the Bible, Christians in the Bible focused on exalting God. That was their primary focus. That's why the Bible says, preach the word. That's why the Bible tells us in Proverbs, do not add to his word lest he rebuke you and you be found to be a liar. This is why the Bible says to sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, which essentially has taken us back to the psalms because the psalms are called spiritual songs. The psalms are called hymns because God has given us a hymn book to sing his word. And we're told explicitly how to worship God. This is called exalting God. How do you think the church today in general, which are not true churches, how do you think they're worshiping? It's not about exalting God. It's about entertaining goats is what they're trying to do. Ultimately, that is what they're trying to do. Big difference, right? Exalting God, entertaining goats. Here's how you know that the whole focus of most of these pastors is trying to entertain goats. If you were to listen to their music, do you think they're doing their music in their churches for God? Be honest. How many of you guys ever have went to a, your own personal radio station and listened to someone that sounds terrible? You're never going to listen to that. Everybody wants to be entertained. You want to sing along to something that, that suits you, right? Depending on your cultural background, you may like rap music. You may like country music. You may like rock music. You may like oldies. And you like to sing along in your car. That's what they're doing for young people in these churches. They want to find something that they like. That's what they're using. What they like. And what's the problem with that? Again, that's not focusing on as God commands. They're worshiping because goats complain. Because that's exactly what will happen. The moment someone complains, they don't like the music, they're going to leave. That is exactly what takes place. So remember what I said. Contrast what takes place today in most of the churches. You focus on what God commands, not what goats complain. You focus on exalting God, not entertaining goats. Even if you take a look at the churches, what is... The primary focus of Jesus' mission, gospel, gospel and gospel. What do you think the focus today is in the vast majority of churches? Gimmicks. It's all about gimmicks. Let me tell you some of the examples of gimmicks. Look at some of the church signs you see out here. Is there a gospel testimony on the church signs? Let me tell you some of the church signs. Pastor wears jeans, so can you. Mom and dad... Come to this church. Your children won't be bored. Those are gimmicks. We have music your kids like, friends their age, a youth pastor they can relate to, all the things that can't save them. We worship here and we get the kids involved so they'll want to stay. That's our way of keeping them here. Well, we don't worship because youth direct the worship. The youth do not direct the worship. God Almighty does. God Almighty directs worship. Or they're going to say, well, we need to find someone that's talented who can lead our music section. So they start hiring worship pastors, worship directors, directors of music ministries. All those titles have one thing in common. They're all unbiblical because there are no worship pastors in the New Testament. So they're giving people what they want to hear. Some churches, so-called, which I don't believe are true churches at all, do you guys know they even pass out a slip of paper to their congregation and a consensus of the type of music they want to hear? That type of stuff is the, the reason why you know they do not have a pastor in their congregation because any pastor worth his salt would have took every table in their congregation and flipped it. Every single so-called committee meeting these people have that pastor would have karate chopped those tables he would have took his own pair of whips and drove those pagans out of there and says you're not going to make uh, the father's house a, a house of thieves or a den of thieves it's a place of prayer it's a place of worship 
It is a place where the gospel is proclaimed. That's what a true gospel minister would have done. That's how we know the vast majority of pastors today in churches, I would call funeral directors shepherding a cemetery full of dry bones. I've said that to you before many times. That's exactly what they're doing. So remember these analogies I use for application to this. But even look at the sermons today in some of these churches. It's interesting because in the vast majority of these so-called contemporary churches, here's what they say. They say, we'll keep it within about a half an hour because people don't really want to hear about all this doctrinal stuff. They don't want to get in all this doctrinal stuff. They're more into relational, having relationships with people. And they say things like, well, we just need to give homilies or sermonettes or, you know, and they start giving these long, exhaustive, storytelling, psycho-babbling garbage is what they're guilty of. And no offense, I'm not interested in some psycho-babbling long story. I'm interested in hearing the Word of God. But when you hear these so-called sermons, they say they're relational. We're not into all this doctrinal stuff. This is the most absurd thing you could ever hear because how do you have a relationship with someone outside of doctrine, outside of gospel truth? What do you think gospel truth is? It's doctrine. So how do you have a relationship with someone outside of the doctrine? Oh, you want to go shopping with your friend? You want to go fishing with your buddy? That's not the church. You come to church, you want gospel fellowship. Your fellowship is grounded in the gospel. That's what true gospel fellowship is. But when people get into this, well, we're not into all this doctrinal stuff. We just keep it simple. Essentially, I argue these people are in bondage because pastors that say that nonsense, and there are some that will say this, we're not into all this doctrinal stuff. I, I abhor that language because essentially what they're doing is they're keeping people in a form of slavery. I've used this illustration before, and I'll give you an example. If you know what took place back in slavery, if you know that some of the slaves were not allowed to read, why do you think they were not allowed to read? Because if they learned things, they could learn how to escape. They could learn how to telegraph someone. They could learn how to communicate, and they would learn that what would take place was wrong, and they would revolt against it. So they would keep people in bondage from learning. And that's what a lot of these pastors will do. They're so ignorant of the gospel and the devil has used them as a means to blind other people by using that ridiculous phrase that we're not into all this doctrinal stuff because they want to keep them in bondage, keep them as ignorant as possible. So they have no problem attending some false gospel church where it's all about uh, entertaining goats and not exalting God. So it's all about gimmicks and not the gospel. That's exactly what takes place today. And I argue, if you're a Christian, you're going to stand against it the exact same way Jesus did here in John chapter 2 when he overthrew those money changers tables and he poured out their paganism right in front of them. And I argue that's what Christians should do as well. Because ultimately, the only worship that is acceptable before God is that which he has commanded, ladies and gentlemen. We know this. If you want true, authentic, legitimate, biblical worship, then you make sure you are in prayer in accordance with the will of God. So don't pray for things that you ought not to pray for. So that means don't go to a pastor, don't go to your friends, and don't pray at home and say, Lord, I really want this nice car. I really want to close on this $300,000 house because the Bible tells you to be content with what you have. Don't ask for the things that you don't need. You have to pray in accordance with the will of God. Secondly, we know you have to read scripture. This is part of worship. Why do you think we read scriptures here at church? Because the Bible commands us to read scriptures. It is the word of God that is the means that unites his particular people to himself, that reveals to them truth that comes from up above. We know that worship today that's acceptable before God is the preaching of the gospel. And it's about those essentials of the Christian gospel. Since we're in the gospel of John, just look at the essentials of the gospel that we learn all throughout the gospel of John. You cannot preach the gospel apart from the doctrine of election. You cannot preach it. And please do not be simple-minded by thinking 
Just because someone uses the word election that they believe in election. No, you better ask people, how do you define election? Because many people will use that word and they don't use it the way you think it means. They don't. If people today say, well, we believe in election because we know God elected us because of the fact that he knew who would believe in him and then he chose them. That's heresy. If someone says, I believe in election, but they view election as God chose us because we accepted him. That's heresy. If people say they believe in election, but they deny reprobation, that's heresy because you cannot separate election and reprobation because both are parts of the doctrine of predestination. So biblical election puts the focus on God alone. It excludes works. It's all about grace and it prohibits any mention of something that we bring to be saved. It's all about grace alone, excluding works. Remember, the remnant according to the election of grace. Predestination, which takes place in eternity of God setting his love upon his particular people before the creation of the world, before they did any good or bad. He loved the elect and he hated the wicked. But then you also have to highlight what did Christ actually accomplish and for whom? As I told you before, it's not gospel worship <coughs> when people are intentionally inclusive with regards to the death of Christ. Instead of saying Christ died for the sheep, Christ died for the elect, Christ died for the wheat, Christ died for the invisible church, Christ died for those that the Father had given to them. The compromiser that's ashamed of these truths will say, well, Christ died for anyone who will put their faith and trust in him. Christ will die for anyone who will believe. Christ died for those that repent. Christ died for all that decide to accept his offer. These are all weak theological views that are commonly espoused by men that are ashamed of the offense of the cross. And of course, it's impossible to talk about worship that is acceptable for, for God without highlighting that perfect righteousness that God accepts alone. Well, we know we have no righteousness of our own. We know that there is nothing we could do to ever appease the Father's wrath, and we know that we could never perfectly keep the law, so we must always look to an alien righteousness that is foreign to us. We must always look to the Savior's perfect obedience to the law, the Savior's particular death. And this becomes ours by imputation. This is our righteousness. This is our assurance before the Father. And the God-given faith in which Christ alone is the object always looks to that perfect righteousness. And the moment you keep your eye away from that righteousness, you're just making it known to others that you do not have a righteousness. You do not have a perfect righteousness that has been credited to your, to your account. Because if you did, you would know that Christ's righteousness alone is what will saturate your mind and it is something that you just can never get enough of. If you're a gospel believer, you will never say, oh, I've heard a topic of righteousness already preached. I've heard it a thousand times. I already get it because gospel believers can never get enough of it. They can't stop talking about it. They want to hear it nonstop. And also gospel believers that hear it enough, trust me, you can speak extemporaneously on it at any time to anyone because if Christ is your righteousness then he is your assurance he is the basis of your justification and this is the heartbeat of the gospel that must be required for true worship today this is the only thing whereby God will say unto his elect well done good and faithful servant let's move on to the next verse 16 he says and he said it to them that sold doves Take these things hence, and make not my father's house a house of merchandise. <coughs> this passage here reveals to us that Jesus Christ takes uh, worship seriously. And notice how he talks about the father's house. And notice Jesus Christ is here among them. Uh, Go to Malachi chapter 3 real quick. I want to show you a, a, a few verses to show you guys how I believe this is fulfillment of an Old Testament text that was highlighted. Please look to Malachi chapter 3, please. 
Malachi chapter 3, verse 1 through 3. Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom you seek shall suddenly come to his temple. Do you read that language right there? He shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant whom he delight in. Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. But who may abide the day of his coming, and who shall stand when he appeareth? For he is like a refiner's fire and like fuller soap. And he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. And he shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. Now go back to John 2, please. So notice how the text says, He shall come. He shall come. Right here they're seeing the Lord come. Notice how it says he shall purge, he shall purify. This is a great example of what that looks like. Purging and purifying. He is casting out. He is overturning. He is pouring out the things that they bring that desecrates the worship of God. Now think about why the worship of God is so important. Why he talks here about not making his father's house a house of merchandise. The topic of worship is so serious that if you look back into the Old Testament, you'll see that those that were guilty of this, the Bible talks about being punishable by death. Read examples like in Exodus where the Bible says, that I'm the Lord your God that brought you out of the land of Egypt, but out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself the carved image, the likeness of anything in the heavens above, on the earth, or those under the earth. You shall not bow down and worship them, for I'm the Lord your God. I am a jealous God. So for someone to offer worship to God that he has not commanded, it's prohibited. Essentially, when people are offering to the Lord something that he has not commanded, they are essentially worshiping a golden calf. And therefore, the Bible here says, you shall not bow down and serve them. What did Moses do when he saw that golden calf? Didn't he have it incinerated and, and the ashes cast into the water and then he made the people drink it? You don't think God is going to do that when he comes back again and he sees the worship that many people offered to him? Additionally, God tells us in his word that worship must be given to him and to no one else. In Isaiah 42, chapter 8, it says, I am the Lord, that is my name, and I give my glory to no one, neither my praise to any graven images. But let's not forget, the Bible explicitly tells us how he is to be worshipped. Today, when you talk about worship from, with people, here's what they primarily will say. Well, I don't have a problem with that. I don't have a problem with that. I don't have a problem with that. You ever hear that a lot? Well, let's be honest. Who cares what you have a problem with? I don't mean that disrespectfully, but when it comes to the worship of God, I'm not worshiping because you have no problem with it. Who cares what you have a problem with? Or someone says, well, I like that worship. Oh, really? You like it? You like it? Who are you worshiping? You should ask yourself, does God like it? Has God commanded it from you? It's not about what you like. It's not about what you don't have a problem with. It is about what God commands. Who is the object of your worship? It's God. Then maybe you should go to God's word and ask yourself, how does God desire to be worshipped? Well, he tells us in the Gospel of John chapter 4. In John 4, it says to worship him in spirit and in truth. Spirit and in truth. Remember, in spirit, what is God? It's a catechism question, right? A catechism question meaning to catechize means to instruct. So when you catechize children, you're instructing them at a young age and you teach them what is God? A simple response, God is a spirit. You can't touch God. So if, the, if I say analogies like at your fingertips or if the Bible says nothing will snatch them out of God's hands, that doesn't mean I'm contradicting myself and that doesn't mean the Bible's contradicting itself. That simply means you're using 
figurative language to describe an action of God. I'm not using figurative language to describe the essence of God. I'm not doing that. I'm describing an action of God. So when the Bible says worship him in spirit, in other words, you have to worship God for who he says he is. If the Bible says he's holy, then you better worship him as he is holy. If the Bible says he is righteous, then you better worship him as the Lord, our righteousness. <coughs> and the Bible says in truth, what is truth? His word. So that means you have to have justification in his word for how you worship him. Now, of course, people will twist that. People will twist what that means. People today are going to say, well, yeah, it says over here, worship him in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. So that means we can uh, worship him in psalms by going to the psalms and hymns and spiritual songs means I can sing some Fanny Crosby, or I can sing some Gettys, or I can sing some Michael W. Smith, and I can be able to add a little country twang into it as well. That's not what the text is saying. There was an old theologian that once said, um, if you put a knife in the, a gun in the hand of a lunatic, he's going to kill people. You put the Bible into a hand of a lunatic, and all he's going to do is twist it and abuse it and hurt people with it. That's not what the text is saying at all. Worshiping God in spirit and in truth means you have to worship God for who he is, and in truth means in accordance with his word. Great example. You, asked me, you may ask me earlier, why did I pray at the very beginning of the service? Well, Philippians 4, 6 says, Be careful for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known unto God. The Bible commands me to. Why do I preach the word? Because 2 Timothy 4 says, Preach the word in season, out of season, convince, rebuke, and exhort. That's why I preach the word. So if the Bible tells us how God is to be worshipped, that is how we are to approach him in worship. Or else you can rest assured, Christ will do to you exactly what he did to these pagan false teachers. He's going to overthrow your stuff. He is going to cast it out and pour it out. That's the analogy I must share with you because that's how serious God takes his worship. And in this text he says... Take these things hence, make not my father's house a house of merchandise. Now in verse 17 it says, And his disciples remembered that it was written, The zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. This goes back to Psalm 69 verse 9. Psalm 69 verse 9, I believe I read that for our Old Testament reading today. It's a direct citation from it. Just reminding us, God takes his worship seriously. But anyone who takes worship seriously is always going to over is always going to have to deal with persecution the same way Jesus did. The identical same way that Jesus did. It doesn't matter. The moment you bring up anything about true worship, people are always going to go to, well, I wasn't raised that way. I didn't do that at my last church. Well, I don't have a problem with this. But again, none of those things are objective truths. None of those things are found in the scriptures. Those are opinions. That's what people think. They think, they think, and that's their first problem is they think and they do not read. If people read, then they would learn that this is what God commands from his people. And it's the same thing when it says, the zeal of thine house has eaten me up. Jesus Christ his gospel approach because essentially Christ, his person and work is the gospel. The Bible tells us that this is the power of God into salvation to those who believe, but to those who are perishing, it will be foolishness. So rest assured if you bring up how God desires to be worshipped, the rest of the world will just call it foolishness. It's not exciting. It's not entertaining. It's not going to attract all their friends. It's not going to be the most appealing place. You're not going to find many talented people there. But the true worship of God is not about a talent show. It's about what God commands. And some people today will fight over petty things. For example, I, I've had in people in churches, they'll say things like, well, you know, we need to hire a talented worship minister because the people in front of me, they don't sing very good, and that throws me off. 
Do you know how petty that sounds? First of all, a talented worship minister, when people say that, my response to them is, did you not see the sign outside? It doesn't say talent, so it says church. Second of all, there are no worship ministers in the Bible. It's congregational singing. And when you say, I can't worship unless I have a talented music minister. So let's get this straight. If you're alive during the second coming, if you go outside and you see Christ riding, riding on his white stead, and he's coming in glory, and he's coming to take flaming, uh, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that don't know God, are you telling me you're not going to worship Christ unless your worship pastor comes to your house and sings songs that you like and then you'll worship him? Well, I, no offense. It's not going to fare well for you on that great day because it goes to show how self-righteous you truly are. The zeal of thine house has eaten me up. Again, the application that I'm going to leave you with today is just remember this. This is an example of his righteous anger towards the wicked. And the moment you take this attitude that Jesus had towards people today that try to desecrate the house of God or people that tolerate false gospels, because essentially that's what false churches are doing. They're offering to the Lord a false gospel, false worship. The moment you have that same attitude that Jesus had towards these money, cha towards these money changers, People are always going to accuse you. They're going to say you're unchristlike, unloving, you're mean-spirited, you're, you're, you're arrogant, that you're not showing any love. You're going to hear all these things. But again, just take them back to Scripture and just say, so is Jesus unloving here? Take them back to Jesus, but also take them to Paul. Take them to Paul. Take them to the Apostle Paul and say, okay, so let's get this straight. So you believe it's unloving. For me to have the same attitude that Christ had towards people that offered a false fire. So did Paul have an, a hate-filled spirit or was he unloving and unchristlike when he ran into that sorcerer in Acts 13? You ever read Paul's interaction with that sorcerer in Acts 13? Let me tell you what took place in Acts 13. In Acts 13, the, there was a, a prudent man that wanted to hear the word of God. He wanted to hear the word of God, but the Bible describes a sorcerer that tried to halt it, that didn't want to allow it to happen. Do you know what Paul said to him? You should read what Paul said. Paul approached him. The Bible says, by the way, he was filled with the Holy Spirit. And Paul approached that sorcerer, and here's what he said to him. He said, you full of mischief, you son of the devil. You enemy of all that is righteous, will, thou now, will not thou cease from perverting the right ways of the Lord? Did you see that language? Was he unloving? Was he mean-spirited? Was he unchristlike when he said it? What about Romans chapter 9? Do you know what you're going to be accused of today if you stick with preaching gospel truths? Do you know, I challenge you guys right now, I want to put a challenge to every single one of you guys right now. I'll send you all my sermon on Romans 9 dealing with election and reprobation. And I challenge you all, send it to your closest loved ones to where they attend church at. Send it to their pastors and say, can you please watch this sermon? Do you know what they're going to come back with? Oh my goodness, that's unloving. I could never say something like that. But yet, the most loving thing Paul said in Romans 9 was, Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated. You see how it's amazing how just simply quoting scripture leaves people feeling gasted by what you had to say? What about Paul in Galatians chapter 2 when he confronted Peter to his face and rebuked him? What about 2 Timothy 4 when he says, convince, rebuke, and exhort? What about Titus 1 when the Bible talks about men that were subverting whole households, teaching things they ought not. And the Bible called them deceivers. And Paul gave the command, rebuke them sharply. Was that unchristlike? Was that unloving? Was that mean-spirited? Was that arrogant? No. The reason why Paul gave those instructions because he knew God's disposition towards those that offer a false worship, that offer a false gospel before the Lord. Jesus gives us a glimpse of this right here in John chapter 2. He overthrew their tables. He poured it out. This tells us of what's coming on the day of judgment. 
If you love people, the best thing you can do is tell them the truth. Judgment is coming. You cannot escape it. I pray to, to the Lord that this message today uh, was edifying and that also it revealed some helpful truths uh, about Christ's message for us. I pray you guys will join me next week. Next week, we're going to talk about the resurrection. By God's grace, Lord willing, I hope to complete John chapter 2 next week. We'll start right at verse 18 and conclude right to the end of the chapter, highlighting a gospel essential of the Christian faith, the resurrection. The resurrection is such an important gospel essential, ladies and gentlemen. Because do you know that Paul said, apart from the resurrection, he said, everything is in vain. Do you understand that? Everything is in vain. In other words, everything is hopeless. Then you've just, you have no hope. Please join me next week as I conclude John chapter 2. Let's pray. Christ, your word is offensive. Your word causes people at times to feel worrisome. But Lord, these are truths that we love. Your people, in general, they love your truth, no matter how it may not be as appealing to the rest of the world around them. Lord, please keep us faithful and focused during these dark times. Lord, we know that during the times when the end will draw near, there will be a great tribulation. The inauguration of the Antichrist will occur. Your true church will feel immense persecution. And there will be, Lord, uh, widespread suffering and death. Lord, prepare us for these times. We pray for those that are woefully unprepared for these cataclysmic events that will soon come upon us like a thief in the night. We pray your gospel will reverberate in this church and in our brothers and sisters' churches that are not with us today but are watching from abroad and even not far from us. We pray, Lord, for our brothers and sisters in Christ who do labor faithfully in your gospel. We pray for their labels, their labors today behind the pulpits. We pray that you will be with them during times of persecution and when they are slandered and maligned for Christ's sake. We pray you will keep them strong, Lord. Keep them steadfast. Guide them in all truth and lead them, Lord, until the end. We pray, Lord, for our loved ones that do not obey the gospel. I pray for my loved ones, Lord. I have many, Lord, whom I call my family that despise your gospel of grace that do not obey the truth, that do not believe in what Christ actually accomplished and for whom. They are conformed to this world. They are despisers of all righteousness. So I pray today, Lord, for their salvation. I pray, Lord, that you will reveal to them this gospel message if it would be your will. And I pray you will take all the glory for yourself, Lord, if it would be your will to save them. So I say the same prayer for my love for my beloved brothers and sisters that are here among us today. I pray you will hear their cries and their petitions for their loved ones. And I pray for them, Lord, that you will keep them faithful no matter how many people may despise them for holding to the truth. It is in the name of Christ, our King and Savior, that we pray. Amen.